Uh, welcome everybody back for the next installation of our uh, webinar series about the issues, approaches, and consequences of the COVID-19 crisis. Uh, I'm Joe Walther, one of the co-hosts, and we have some very stimulating speakers for you today. Before I turn it over to them, just a couple of reminders to help you orient to uh, some of our activities and our information. And uh, hopefully you now see a little snapshot of our homepage. Once again, I'd like to begin with this to let people know where they can find our webpage. And we are updating the webpage uh, very regularly. Uh, it's got a little redesign now to help you find uh, more information, but we do have a few more of the speakers and topics lined up. I would also point out uh, in some of these sections we redesigned, so the links to our recordings of the previous sessions are now right there on the front page, very easy to find if you want to catch up on some of the sessions we've had in the past. And a feature that remains on this page, there is a place where you can click and sign up. Uh, it takes you to a Google group facility where you uh, can sign up if you wish to be on our mailing list to be notified uh, and reminded of the uh, webinars as they unfold each week. Well, I'd like to get out of the way and just say thanks and welcome and introduce to you our two speakers today. Uh, who will be addressing the topic of coping with heterogeneity and uncertainty of the COVID-19 data, data sets. Ambush Singh, my co-host and good colleague, will be the first speaker today. Ambush is a professor in computer science. Although he has his fingers in many things on campus, he's an ambassador of goodwill and a real change maker. He studies network science, machine learning, social networks, decision sciences, and bioinformatics, and as well, he's been the pioneer to lead us into the new data science initiative, planning and implementing training and research activities and curricula at several levels around data science. Uh, following Ambush will be another guest of ours today, Yusheng Wen, who is a, an assistant professor also in computer science. Yusheng knows a great deal about machine learning with a special focus on statistical theory and methodology, He's co-director of our very new Center for Responsible Machine Learning and is leading a new, uh, co-leading a new NSF project modeling COVID-19 with using artificial intelligence and machine learning methods. So uh, these gentlemen are both uh, very smart. They know a lot of things and uh, I'm looking forward to learning from them today. I'll turn off my sharing of the screen and turn it over to Professor Singh. Thank you, Ambush, go ahead. Thank you, Joe. Let me just get started. Let me share my screen and then I'll get started. While you are getting that uh, ready, Ambush, let me remind our viewers that in your Zoom application, there should be a Q&A button at the bottom of the screen. Please feel free to post a question to our speakers today. We're going to hold those questions until the end, and then we will try to uh, share with our speakers as many of them as we can get to. So please look for that button and uh, post your questions there. We'll sort them out when we get the chance. Thanks, Ambush. Thank you, Joe. So, so let's get started. As uh, Joe mentioned, this is the third in the series of talks. Before I begin, I would like to say thank you to everyone who is taking much higher risks than we are in our safe homes and rooms. So thank us, thanks to the doctors, nurses, and everyone in the hospital healthcare biomedical ecosystem. And also thanks to all of us who have had to live through a new way of trying to go about our work and life. So we have, this is a third in the talk. So we heard the uh, talk on April 14th in which we heard about the biology and the medical aspects and the healthcare aspects of the disease. And then last week we heard about the, how do we model the, dynamics of the disease. Uh, today, we'll try to talk about data. So there should be something between these two, which is data. To understand the disease and to build a model on that, you need data, and that in turn leads to policy. So this is what this uh, talk will be about, is how do we get the data to inform the models and to inform the policy making? So before I begin, I'd like to start with some lessons from history. 
So this is not the first outbreak of this kind we have had. Of course, the scale is a lot different. So I'd like to go back and learn from the history and try to understand how have data and models informed how we have decided in the past. So I picked out three cases here. I'd like to start with the model of a cholera outbreak, which happened in London in 1854. So if you go back to that time, our understanding of what a disease is was a lot different. So at that specific moment in time, there was this model of disease uh, where disease gets spread by bad air. So this was the miasma, the theory of the disease. Dr. John Snow at that specific time believed that cholera is being caused not because of bad air, but it's because caused by water. So he did some extensive research around the water pumps in London, and he found a, a specific water pump on Broad Street, in which he was able to show that all the people that were in contact with that specific water, which could be homes, restaurants, coffee shops, breweries, he was able to do contact tracing of water at that time and be able to show that it was a pump on Broad Street that led to the disease. Now, uh, you're seeing a map, and then you're also seeing a water pump that has been erected in the honor of John Snow in Broad Street in London. So let's move forward from 1854 to a few, to let's say 60 more years. And this is the, Spanish flu of 1918-19. Now this was the most severe pandemic in recent history. It led to about 500 people or one third of the people in the world that lived then were infected with this virus. The number of deaths worldwide was about 50 million and there are about over 600,000 deaths in the US alone. Now, there has been some amount of data that has been captured, and we have had a chance now to look at what that data means. And you, you may have seen other graphs that have shown the effect on cities like St. Louis versus Philadelphia in terms of where the, the peak was much less and it was more longer rather than, it was flattened rather than in some other parts of the world. And you have also seen as to what has happened when that control was lifted too early. So there is one specific term that we'll be seeing over and over again. This is the NPI, so non-pharmaceutical intervention. And this is what we have to resort to before we actually have a vaccine or we have a cure. So based upon data that we have right now, it's been able to show that the ways that we implement NPI affects the, how disease gets transmitted. And, that's, and if you lift this, uh, the NPI is too early, the spread restarts. And there are stories on that specific aspect. Let me fast forward to less than 10 years ago. So this is a modern era where we have access to building models, we have access to trying to predict how things will happen. So in 2013-16, there was a uh, Ebola virus and that spread in the parts of Africa that's are being shown in this part of the map over here. So at that time, the models that were built, they predicted half a million to 1.4 million infections. A year later, however, there are only 25,000 cases, including about uh, 10,000 deaths. Prediction was 10 times worse than what actually happened on the ground. And there have papers that have been published in order to understand why that has happened. So one source of error has been pointed to is when you have errors that evaluate just on history, 
the most likely history of the system and you don't allow for stochastic models. The other aspect that models find it very difficult to understand is the human element. How does the human behavior change? And the analysis of the Ebola models found that the human behavior changed at a much faster rate than what the models predicted. Now, of course, it's great to have these models. And now there are also a number of papers that have been published that have showed if this model was used, it would have made the predictions very well at that time. Now, there is a famous saying, it is difficult to make predictions, especially about the future. So yeah, it's, uh, it is hard. So we are trying to live through this, uh, the COVID-19 disease. And I'm sure once the disease uh, goes away or it reduces, there'll be lots of papers that would be published saying that we got it right, but the challenge is trying to get it right now is much harder than in a post hoc manner. So there was a nice uh, quote that I found in which the, the quote, it's, it's going to read it. it Ebola fight the profits of, it never went airborne and its economic effects were less painful than expected. Being wrong, rarely feels this good, but it will be harder to catch the world's attention next time. So this was in February of 2015, and now we are five years down the road. And now we have to ask ourselves, how are our models working all this time? Well, I think what has happened since then is this, this specific error in terms of trying to imagine just one state of the system. I think that models have become much better and they examine uh, multiple of the system. The aspect of trying to understand human behavior is still very difficult. And I think models still are not doing the right job in terms of trying to understand the effects of how people change their behavior and how will it do to the dynamics of the disease. So, so let's uh, keep going forward. So this is what we have in, uh, in front of you today. So we discussed aspect of the history. We'll look at next some aspects of the different kinds of data sets that we have to inform us about the COVID-19 disease. We'll look at how can one measure the effect of NPIs. And as I, as I, as I just mentioned, those are the hardest one to get a handle on as to how they may affect the disease uh, dynamics. We'll look at what are the current models and how they use the data. We'll look at contact tracing. That's been one way of trying to uh, get a handle on the dynamics of the disease and finding a way of trying to get things to open up again. And then after that, I will hand over the floor to my brilliant colleague, uh, Yushang Wang, who is going to be talking about those three uh, items there. He'll talk about uncertainty and bias. He'll look at a specific case study of how do you fit an SIR model to the Santa Barbara data, and he'll talk about some future issues. So let's start with the COVID data. So the COVID data that we have is heterogeneous, it's uncertain and dynamic. So in the next uh, two or three slides, I'll try to illustrate what is it that I mean by that. So the it is heterogeneous in the, in the sense that the risk factors vary at the level of a single person. They vary at the level of a country or a region based upon geography, culture, and the human element. The number of variables that you have that you need to model becomes really, really large and some that we don't have. In. So this modeling is very difficult. We have variation at the level of a single um, person, variation at the level of a region, and you have aspects of the human being. And then this 
data that we are looking at are un is, is uncertain. Testing errors are, are there. We, for, as, as you would have seen in the last week, we are not certain about what is the rate, what is the dynamics of the disease itself. Does a parameter go, is it at four days or eight days or 12 days? How long it takes someone to heal? The contact rate, what is the rate at which someone who is infected meets with people that are in a safe state? That is hard to gauge. The disease dynamics in terms of do people show symptoms or not? Diagnosis is hard. And then we have sampling. Uh, we are trying to sample from a population and it is not clear whether these samplings are are biased or not. So then, so we have a data set that's heterogeneous, data set that's uncertain. And finally, it's a data set that is highly dynamic. It's dynamic in the sense that there is frequent tightening and loosening of the interventions, changes in behavior, and the, and the disease dynamic itself changes at the level of a single person or the level of a population. Now, I will just get into this briefly. You'll hear more about it uh, later by Yushan. Uh, if you were to just look at where we are in this county, so we have about 450,000 people. And if you look at the state right now, so we have 200 infected and 300 that are in the recovered state. And you assume an SIR model and you assume that gamma is uh, 0.2, just based upon how many, so you see, all I want you to note is that there are four different curves. All of them are peaking at different times. And what changes as we go across these four, uh, four curves are how many of the people that you see have the symptoms versus how many that have the disease but are not showing symptoms and a change in the value of your beta parameter. And remember, this beta is what you can affect by an intervention. You, when you have a lockdown, the amount of beta becomes smaller. So just by looking at these uh, two different aspects of the data, you can get to four different curves that they look a lot different. And that should explain as to why it's a disease that's hard to model. Right. Let me move, uh, move ahead. So this is a state of the disease. So this is to show you that the country right now is at different stages of the disease. So, so this was a recent uh, plot. And it will, what uh, one examined was to look at what is the ratio between of all the tests that were done, what are the ratio, what's the ratio of the positive tests that are happening. And it tried to look at different countries, uh, different states based upon how that ratio has changed over time and colored them based upon one that where that peak has been reached. So you can see that there are multiple colors. So the states right now are in different states with respect to the disease. Let me push on ahead and look at this aspect of what is all the data that is out there. So, so this question about, so this is, we observe and control the disease dynamic. And I've tried to break this data down into three different parts. One is the biomedical data, which comes from the basic biology. So the transmission fractions, how, what is in incubation period, the recovery rate, death rate, and so on. So what are the effects on age? What is the effect on that? So, so this, I've tried to mark some data. This is my personal viewpoint in terms of how certain we are about when we say a specific number, how certain we are that's, that number is right. So this data is what I've marked in red. We are very uncertain about this. For example, if you were to look at this basic question of does it does this disease make us immune to the future? 
that is not known right now. Then you have this data we try to gather at the level of an entire population. So here, there is some things that are marked in blue, which is based upon census data, what is the age distributions, the number of people in the hospital, ICU. And then we, became, we become uncertain about what is the number of infections. We are uncertain about the number of deaths because there are a number of deaths that are happening which are not being marked as a death because of the, of the disease. And there are also deaths that are happening not in a hospital and those are not being counted. So, so, so this part has got a mixture of things that we are highly uncertain about and that we are pretty certain about these values. And then we have the last set, which I call the contact data. So these two are what you can only see in the, under, uh, in the underlying system. That we, we observe this, we observe this. This uh, box is what you can observe, what you see, plus you can control. And this is the contact data. So now, there are, in here, there's some things that we know. We can measure what is the highway traffic, the air traffic. We can measure what are these larger events, what are the schools that have closed, the businesses which have closed. And also, there are some that we are uncertain about in terms of the human mobility pattern or how does this uh, pattern change with age. So these are the different sources of data that we have in terms of trying to uh, build these models. If you were to look at the sources of data sets, there are a large number of these sources. I'll leave this out to more. Uh, Yushang is going to be talking more about some of these sources of, of data which is, which is out there. I would just like to make one remark in terms of policy, which is captured by a quote from a, from a recent issue of Economist, which is asking for that it's time that we also publish the models. So not only the data, but the, pub, but the models also ought to be published. And finally, I would just like to note that our, the rate at which we are getting new papers in this area is about 24 per day and the peer review system is trained. It's hard to even know what is true and what is not true. Um, this is a data set I'd just like to show in terms of a picture. This is a data that says what is the rate at which we are traveling right now and how it has changed from prior to now. What is the effect of the lockdown and there are different parts of the, of the country that are being shown in different colors. So if it is uh, lighter, it means that lockdown has had an effect. If it is darker, it just means that the lockdown has not had an effect. So let's look at how do we, how does policy making work with data that we're uncertain about? So I'd like to point out an anecdote about President Johnson. When he heard an economist uh, talk about the range of values, President Johnson's response was, ranges are for cattle, give me a number. So it's difficult to convey uncertainty in data while you're trying to do policy making. People want to have simple answers. It's very difficult to understand ranges. Right. And then when you are building a model, you are not only working with one kind of data, but you are working with multiple sources of uncertain data, and they all have ranges in them. So you are looking at the effect of multiple uncertain values. They interact with each other in unknown ways, and therefore it's very difficult to get these models right. So how do current models use data? So I'll go through very quickly about the uh, different models. We have heard about them in the last uh, uh, talk by Professor Bolo. 
So there is this model called Chime, a Chai model, which has been used as, as one of the two models to try to predict what is going to be the hospital capacity in the state. And it does a very simple modeling. So it's built based upon the SIR model. It looks at what are the number of people that are in the hospital right now, uses that to predict the number of infections, and then looks at what is the current doubling rate and uses that to predict the infection rate. The other parameter that it uses is the recovery rate, and that is uh, hard-coded into the model. And it has been used to predict the rate of hospital admits, the rate of ICUs, and so on. Uh, we read about, we heard about this other model last week, which comes from the Imperial uh, College. So it's based upon a stochastic model that tries to understand how, uh, looks at the movement of, of people and looks at the contact rates of, of people. This model is uh, pretty well grounded. There is an issue in terms of how well it's going to scale up. And it raises this question about, it looks at the, at the different data and learns the models. It raises this question about, can we learn directly from the data itself? And then there is the IHME model, which does a time series matching. And we also heard about this in the last week. So I'd just like to point out a few things about it. It's difficult for this model to make predictions at the, at the smaller scale. So it's hard to, for you to make predictions in terms of a single city. It is sensitive to the exact number of deaths. And we just, we just saw that the number of deaths is very difficult to get a handle on that because there are deaths that are not being reported from the right places. And also the, the cause of death is not entirely known. I would also like to point out that in this model, it's very difficult to say, if I were to intervene now, what will happen next week? Because it has to rely upon what the model has seen in order to predict the future behavior. It's, it doesn't model the mechanism itself. So it's very difficult for this model to make new predictions. And if you were to, if we are following the history, you would have seen that this model has had to change its predictions very quickly. And there is also this, the multi-scale models that I won't have, I'll skip, but this, what you're doing here is that you build the model at three different levels, at the lowest level, which is based upon a model like the SIR, a middle level, which is based upon like the highway traffic, and the top level is based upon air traffic. And this model predicted the, how the transmission of the disease is going to happen from Wuhan. So in the last few minutes, I would like to spend some time talking about contact tracing. So this has been a requirement by the CDC to open up the country. And there are of course two ways to implement this. One, you can do it by manually, which has been done in a country like New Zealand. And you, you can try to do it with the help of a phone app. If you were to do it manually, the current estimate is that we'll need to employ somewhere between 100,000 to 300,000 people to be, to be able to do manual tracing. Right now, there are different countries. I just have a uh, subset of, of the actual uh, countries which is out there. There's a number of countries and a number of apps that have been deployed in order to be able to contact trace. Just like to point out that we have had success of this method in New Zealand. The number of new cases has dropped to single digits. There are questions in terms of how do you make it work in practice? There is a question about should contact tracing also include GPS data? What's the effect of missing data and false positive? What's the effect on privacy? I'd like to build upon this idea a bit more on the next slides. So here, it's my personal point of view. 
is about this uh, can how to make contact tracing and NPIs work on campus. So this is something that we all need to be thinking about. It's my personal point of view, but do read this piece that was published this week by the president of Brown and where she talks about how to open up a campus. So these are some thoughts about how we might be doing contact tracing and how we can implement NPIs on campus. So one option would be that students, staff, faculty could opt in, whether they want to be a part of it. So the ones that opt in be, will be using a phone app or else will have to resort to a manual system without that. You can estimate what is a state of a, of a single person based upon their pattern of movement, the disease states of other people that they contact and, and the state of where they visit or where they live. So that's the idea is can we get to understand it? Can you get to and try to predict what is the state of infection of a specific person? Now, if you can get that, if you assume that uh, on campus we have say 35,000 people, we can build a contact network of that many nodes. So just imagine a network with 35,000 nodes. It's not a large network. We are right now working with networks which have millions of nodes in them. We need to understand in this network two specific aspects of people. What is their own health? What is the state of their own health? Are they at risk? And what is the prior state of what is the level of the disease right now? Is it SIR or some other uh, way of trying to look at multiple states of the disease? If we can build that, then we also have a system to test people. And that will be if we can test out people that are at risk and test out the hub nodes in this large network. So we need to be, we need to have a system in place that can ensure that the reproduction number is less than one at every node in this network. So if we can do that, and at the same time, so we need to be doing three things. We need to have this network in which we can predict so, so that's one, and we build that network, then we need to have a system for testing. And the third aspect is that we need to build a way of trying to treat people that have fallen sick. And for if we are, if we are going to teach larger courses, we need to have a way of trying to have an alternate plan if things don't work out. If you have an instructor, TAs, staff that falls sick, what is the plan? If we can make those three things happen, then it is feasible that a campus like UCSB can open up. Now, of course, this is a very personal point of view. Uh, there are people that know a lot more about this topic than I do, and they will have, have to bring to bear their own knowledge on this. There is one issue that comes about when you build this network, which is when you build this contact network. This raises this question about what the issue about data is going to be private. And that is a key issue. And that's what something, what's an issue that uh, Yushan will be talking about more in his research work, in his uh, presentation. So how do you ensure this data that we are going to collect, this data on which you're trying to make judgments, how do we ensure that this data remains private? And there, this is an idea in which there's been ongoing research. Uh, 
at UCSB and elsewhere, and that can be brought to bear and ensure that this data that we're going to collect remains private. So with that, I'm going to hand over the floor to my brilliant colleague, uh, Yushan Wang. Uh, Yushan, it's all yours. You can take it from here. Thank you. All right, thank you very much, Hambuj. Um, so that, that's a very, very, very nice coverage of uh, uh, many of aspects of the uncertainty in data. So let me try sharing my, um, my screen to see if, all right, um, I'm sure people can see it now. Um, so um, in the remainder of the talk, um, uh, here's what I'm gonna be, be, be talking about. Um, uh, at first, I'll, I'll give a closer look at the different types of uncertainty with specific ex examples given for those uncertainties. And then um, I'll do a short case study that I've been working on in the past uh, two days by trying to fit the parameters of the, the popular SIR model to the uh, data that's available for Santa Barbara County so as to illustrate some of the points about uncertainty in data and the uncertainty in the modeling process and so on. And finally, I'll revisit some of the ideas that Ambush have been, been talking about uh, in, in the last couple of slides uh, um, and, and describe a potential uh, hypothetical path towards reopening UCSB and, and what are uh, and talk about the challenges and, and opportunities um, um, during the process. All right, so let, let's get it started. Uh, so, um, so speaking of um, uncertainty uh, in, in modeling COVID-19 um, pandemic, um, so this, this is a constant discussion for a lot of the models that has been published and has been very popular. It's all over in the news media. Um, so if you have, have happened to click um, on the IMHE website and, and saw this uh, uh, figure, so you will see that this is the forecasting of the number of deaths per day uh, in the United States. Uh, so you have uh, th these curves. Uh, so you, so, um, now could you give me a second? Let me um, open that. Yes. There we go. Yeah, sorry for the glitch. All right. So, so, um, so if you look at the, uh, if you look at the, um, the curve, so these are the part of the data that are coming from the actually realized the history. So, so we are plotting the number of deaths per day up to this point, and from this point onwards, with this shaded area. Um, so these are the forecasting that are made uh, under the, the, the IMHE model about what's going to happen in the future. So luckily, we, we can see from this figure that we have already passed the, the peak. And if the model is predicting correctly, we'll see a, a steady decline of the number of deaths per day. And, and hopefully by June, um, and, and the thing will be settled and we'll, 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 we'll no longer have any additional um, cases in, in, in COVID-19. Uh, COVID Okay, so how do we make sense of this uh, shaded band of uncertainty? So, 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 so Chris Murray himself and this illustration, um, they have an awesome team that came up with this um, explanation. If you click on this uh, little information sign, so this is what pops out. Okay, so I'm gonna highlight uh, some of their explanations. It says uncertainty is a range of values uh, that are likely to include the corrected projected estimates. Okay. And, and they also talk about how wide and how narrow these uncertainty intervals are. Because as we can see, the predicted intervals are actually very wide um, in, 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 their, in their projections. Okay, it's commented that with, um, uh, if the data is small, if um, there are conflicting data, if the data is, many of the data is not available, and then the, the uncertainty interval will be large. On the other hand, suppose you have infinite data at your disposal, then that means that you will have narrower confidence interval uh, for you to make uh, more confident predictions of the future. Okay, so I'm going to take a, a one step further and talk about um, what, what they actually mean um, by, by, by saying that. So, so the uncertainty band is actually coming from not just one source, they are coming from multiple uh, sources. So one of the um, one of the major sources that are, um, the uncertainty is coming from is coming from how much data that you have um, for you to estimate the parameters of your model. And the uncertainty of the, um, um, your estimate of the model parameter um, will, will eventually also uh, result in uncertainty in the predictions that are, you are using your model for. 
Okay, and there are also uncertainty in the natural random process uh, of the world. So, so I argue that it is the first category of uncertainty that the the the, the, the Murray models uh, measuring. And that's why they are mentioning that as number of data gets larger and then the uncertainty can bend, can get narrower and narrower. However, that's not the only source of uncertainty that's out there. There are also um, other sources of uncertainties that are in some sense more persistent and more and more, more challenging to deal with. Um, in, in particular, suppose the, the model itself doesn't really depict the reality accurately. So there are biases in the model itself that doesn't really um, reflect in the data that are, you, you, you collect. Then, then, then that's the kind of model that doesn't really uh, get smaller even if you have a large data set. In addition, the data itself can be, can be biased and uncertain as well um, due to the notorious um, like sample selection issue. Um, I'll give an example. So, so the Mori model is based on the number of deaths. They're also based on, um, I guess, number of confirmed cases and um, the, 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 uh, how, how many have recovered from the process in Wuhan, in Italy, um, and perhaps also in many of the, the, the locations in, in the United States. But notice that um, we, we only observe the number of deaths that are counted towards, um, um, like that, that are accounted for, for, for COVID-19, the uh, deaths from COVID-19. Um, there are many other um, deaths that are potentially caused by uh, a less serious um, uh, um, um, conditions or they, they might be caused by, uh, uh, they may occur for people who, who didn't actually get to visit the hospital due to the hospital being full. So there are a whole, a whole variety of different possibilities that the, the observed data is not really capturing the underlying, um, um, underlying process. Okay, so these are issues that are more difficult to, to deal with. But fortunately, they are um, like, at least in the hindsight, when we look back and we can, um, like, we can hypothesize what the model have predicted at any given point, and then look at the day after that and see how accurate that, that the, the prediction of the model uh, is. And, and using these model checking techniques that allows us to um, sometimes detect if there is a bias in the model, if there are biases in the sample selection process, so we can somehow, uh, uh, um, we can somehow correct and adjust for. And finally, the most difficult form of uncertainty is coming from the non-stationarity um, that, that is inherent in any natural occurring processes uh, when, when, when time is evolving. In particular, people's behavior might, might change, and there are new interventions that are in place, um, which, which may, might have significantly changed how likely um, people can, um, can get in touch with other people with, with, the, uh, with the disease. Okay, so um, interventions, however, they are um, extremely, um, wait, um, Yeah, um, I, I think I'm having the wrong version of the um, uh, of the slides. So, so let me let me reshare and and just just give me one second. Um, okay. Sorry for the technical glitch. All right, can people see the shared screen? Yes. Okay. Okay, so, 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 so this issue highlights the need for a really localized model, but unfortunately, um, 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 like um, different, different locations have like very different demographics and how they, they um, um, respond to interventions and they have different industry compositions and so on. So, so these uh, issues highlight the need to build separate models for different, um, different locations. The, the issue is that like, despite the um, widespread of the pandemic, we, we do not actually have enough local data to, 
to build one different model for, for, for each city and for each lo local community. Um, so, so let me illustrate this with the actual data that I extract from the, um, um, from, 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 the, from, from the numbers that are provided by, by Johns Hopkins University. So all these data are actually available that so you can download um, from, from their GitHub website. Okay, so, um, so I'm plotting the, the, the number of cities that have a specific number of cases. Okay, so these are histogram plots and every dot um, is, a, is, a num um, is one particular being of that histogram. As we can see, uh, I'm plotting this in the in the log log scale, uh, where both dimensions are, are are plotted in the uh, in the logarithmic scale. Um, so we, we see some things that's very much like a like a linear uh, trend. And, and what what this indicates is that we are really in a very heavy tailed uh, situation where most of the city will have no data at all, and some of the cities will have like very limited um, uh, num number of data points. For instance, Santa Barbara, um, by yesterday, it only has seven deaths and 469 cases, while in New York City, it, it's, it's many times, many fold larger. Moreover, the number of days since the first confirmed case is also vary uh, uh, across different counties. So I'm, I'm plotting the, um, the, the similar histogram for the number of cases uh, by, by the number of days since the first confirmed cases. Santa Barbara is doing okay in this regard. We have 41 days, which means that if we do a time series forecasting uh, type of models, then we have 41 days of the data to validate the model and to actually predict, um, um, to, 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 to narrow, narrow down the confidence interval. Okay, so let's revisit the simple uh, SNR model um, that uh, Francesco talked about last week. And then maybe try to fit this model to figure out what the parameters are specifically for the Santa Barbara model. And then we can visualize the confidence interval to see whether we actually have enough data to do all the necessary inferences. Okay, so as SSR model have um, two important parameters, beta and gamma, and beta measures the expected number of people one patient can affect every day. And gamma measures the percentage of infected people recovering. Uh, or dying um, per day. So using these two parameters, uh, we, can, we can simulate this, this differential equation. Um, and and so allow me to add uh, some uh, minor adjustments to this model because this model can, can never really capture the, the, the actual data. So we have to um, account for the uncertainty. So there are two ways that we, are, we account for it. First, we simply fit everything to the curve and then minimize the, 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 the total error. And the second, we can do some kind of stochastic uh, modeling by adding the, the noise, by saying that um, the actual data is coming from this, this stochastic process, okay? And, and in some cases, when um, uh, there's, uh, there's a third parameter um, that can be used to, to lead to a better fit of, of the curve, that is the size of the susceptible population. So, so Ambuch have talked about in Santa Barbara County, we have about 45,000 people. And not every one of them are susceptible, so, so maybe we can see a smaller n that's coming out of the fitted model. Okay. So, um, so, so here's the results algebraically that we got uh, using a very uh, rough sketch of, uh, of the calculation of this uncertainty. So, so among the two methods that I used to, to build this model and, and capture the uncertainty, um, I'm, I'm getting the estimate of this beta parameter um, within two intervals. So again, we have ranges, uh, and these ranges uh, tells us how much we are uncertain about our estimate. Okay, so, so by looking at just this, it's, it's like we can't really see anything, so let's put these models in action and see what the predictions are from this model. Suppose we start from the very beginning uh, of, of the pandemic and, and then wanted to just just use these numbers to see how, how well that it matches what actually showed out, what actually turned out in Santa Barbara. Okay, so starting from day one, uh, we can see that, um, um, so, so, so what, what I'm plotting is a number of actual cases uh, in, uh, in, in green, and then I'm plotting the, the predicted uh, number of cases using the SIR fitted SIR model with the two different approaches. And the shaded area correspond to the confidence bands that are, um, coming from the uncertainty in the estimated parameter. So as we can see, um, so we, we see, depending on how we are modeling the process, we see a very different type of un uncertainty that are indicated by the, by the model. So on the one hand, the, the, the least square fit, that's the one in, in purple, 
it, it matches the, um, the curve that's actually realized a little bit better, but it gives a very poor uh, confidence band. It has an unrealistically narrow confidence band that doesn't actually cover what's going on. Um, the, the stochastic model worked a little bit better in that regard, but because of that, um, the, 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 this, this uh, super wide confidence band, it also cannot be used uh, for, to, to draw meaningful conclusions uh, in terms of policy making. So what's the problem? So if you look at it, the, um, if uh, any model that's following the SIR model uh, in the early stages, um, such as in Santa Barbara, we should see a, a, a straight line. But the actual realized data is not actually a straight line. It says that neither model is actually correct. Um, so, so we're not taking into account of all the uh, non-pharmaceutical interventions that are, um, that, uh, that, that are happening in every single day uh, during, during the process. Um, as a matter of fact, we, we see this um, in the data all over the world. So this is a figure from, from a while ago when the US is still uh, have a much smaller number of cases. So we see that uh, the different events that are happening all over the world in, in locking down in other types of non-pharmaceutical interventions are actually significantly affecting how the, the pandemic would evolve over time. Okay, so we need to maybe take that into account before we can draw a better picture for, for locally for Santa Barbara. Um, so so let's, let's take a look at what are the uh, significant effects that might have affected uh, the spread of the pandemic. So, so in, in March 10, UCSB transitions into uh, remote instruction even before the, the, the first reported case in Santa Barbara County. And by March 19, there's a statewide state at home order that's issued. And uh, on March 31st, um, there, there are finally two cases that are confirmed within the UCSB community. Okay, so, so the number zero on the horizontal axis of this figure is actually March 16. So which, which says that uh, if we really want to build the right model without the intervention, then we only have like three day worth of data. So it's really impossible to build an accurate model using that uh, little data um, um, at all. Um, so um, um, the reality is even worse than that because the, 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 the intervention is complex and multidimensional. So there are many other different uh, factors that can be playing a role here that are not actually captured by, by, by the model. And the same issue would reappear when we try to use the model to inform us on how and when and, and, and uh, we're going to reopen UCSB and re re restart our economy. Okay, so, um, uh, so, 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 so luckily, uh, a lot of these, these issues, a lot of these interventions and their corresponding effect can be um, like objectively measured using the data that Ambush talked about. We can use the phone tracking data that measures the, 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 the changes in behaviors at every uh, location uh, of the United States. Uh, so there are multiple sources of this that's coming from, um, um, that, 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 that's coming from phone company, um, coming from Google and Facebook and so on. Um, the issue is that each one of these data can only touch upon um, the user base of, of these companies. And, and these are a biased representation of, of the population. So how are we gonna collect all these data together to adjust for the effect of intervention will become critical um, for, for us to draw meaningful inferences um, about, uh, uh, about the effect of intervention, how it affects the spread of, of the pandemic. Okay. So, um, so, so here's one way that we can go, go ahead um, in, in, in measuring uh, the effect of interventions, even for those interventions that, that hasn't been, been used before. Um, specifically, um, there, there are just so, so many different dimensions that the, uh, the intervention can take. Um, and, and well, if we just do it one by one, we will never really have enough data. So one approach that's, um, that, that's popular uh, uh, requires us to make a little bit of a model assumption, which says that we can perhaps describe the different type of interventions by their characteristics. If we can somehow do that and then represent every um, uh, intervention by their features, um, then we can potentially um, make use of these features and make use of the features of different local communities to make inferences about new cases when new interventions are employed in a, in a different location other than those places where have gone through a, a similar kind of intervention. Okay, um, uh, moreover, like uh, 
um, we, we also somehow need to take care of the, the, the sample, uh, sample selection issue by modeling the data observation process so that we can um, um, have, a, uh, have a process that allows us to make inferences about what's really going on uh, in, the, in the unseen world in, in those people who haven't uh, come to the hospital that contributed to the spread of the pandemic. So um, um, some uh, objective data in that regard will be hugely helpful. So, so this approach, um, so uh, I, I believe many of the researchers around the world has already been working on, have seen some initial uh, success, can potentially be also applied to the more, more challenging problem in the even data scarce um, setting of, uh, um, of how, how do we make decisions about re reopening uh, our, our university campus. Okay, so um, we can potentially build a refined model on the local level, as, as Ambush suggested, that allow us to to, to describe each individual by features, and then maybe estimate the risk factor corresponding to each student and each faculty member, each staff member uh, individually. And with that, we can maybe design rules to target testing and risk testing of those high-risk individuals so that we can keep the spread of some pandemic uh, uh, at, a, at a relatively low rate. Um, finally, um, I, I think it's a good idea to implement measures that are known to work so even if we do not completely understand the, the quantitatively um, what 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 the the, um, the exact effect of those approaches would be like uh, in the in the local community, um, because provided that we know that the, the it is going to improve the situation, then that will lead, lead to, um, to to significant benefit. So much like in the Ebola case, um, like. Um, maybe the model is predicting it wrong, and that's that's evolved by the model builder, but. If at the end of the day, the, the seriousness of the pandemic is, uh, is significantly lower and the impact to everybody is much lower, then, then, um, then making the wrong predictions, you know, very dire looking model projections uh, would feel actually quite good uh, at the end of the day. Okay, so, so um, some of these approaches, such as contact tracing, would raise privacy concerns, as Ambush have mentioned earlier. Um, so so I, I don't have much time to say anything about it, but I wanted to say that this is a real issue and there often involve fundamental trade-offs between how accurate the model is and, and how much privacy that we allow people to have. Um, um, and the good news is that there are a lot of existing work on that, a lot of existing research and deployed technology on this matter. So even the US Census Bureau have adopted the technology called differential privacy to, to address this issue. So, so when it comes to um, the situation of trading off between privacy and, and the utility of the model, and then we, we have all the tools that are necessary to make the right choices when, when the time comes. Okay, so um, at the very end, I'd like to conclude with this slide, um, 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 quoting the, 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 uh, the popular quote by, by, by George Box. So all models are wrong, um, obviously, because we can never really model the world uh, exactly, but um, the, the actual measure of whether a model is useful or, or not um, um, is by, by, by how much impact this model is in terms of decision making and how, how, we, can, um, like, uh, uh, how we can quantify the usefulness of, of, of a model. Okay, so at the end of the day, like for decision makers uh, purposes, maybe we'll somehow go back to, to Lyndon Johnson's cattles um, um, and then make decisions with ranges rather than, uh, rather than based on a single number. And, and, and I, I think computer science and, and statistics and data science are playing a central role here to actually coming up with meaningful and quantifiable uncertainty uh, that, and, and with explicit stated assumptions and potential pitfalls. Okay, so um, um, that's the end of my talk. Uh, so I wanted to use the last slide to, to announce a recently funded project on modeling COVID-19 um, um, by, by, by Shifeng, uh, Shifeng Yan and, and myself. So we're both colleagues in computer science uh, department. And this is also a collaborative work with uh, people in Cottage House. Um, so I wanted to say that we cannot really do it alone. Like suppose we want to use the proposed technique for uh, modeling the case in UCSB, we, uh, we, we need your help. Uh, we need any connections and data that are potentially becoming available uh, so that so as we can make informed decisions and then build this model and, and then we'll, we'll, we'll get through this crisis together. So um, thank you very much. And I'm sorry for the technical glitches and I'm happy to 
answer um, questions um, uh, with Ambuch. Thank you very much, Yushan. That was uh, uh, very informative. Both of you uh, taught us a lot today. Uh, I'm afraid uh, we have reached the end of our time period for today. There were two questions, very stimulating questions, and I apologize to those inquirers that we uh, are out of time to get to them today. But I'll pass them on to our speakers. You identified yourselves, so perhaps they can get uh, back to you offline. Thanks again for joining us. We will have uh, uh, our lineup refreshed and renewed on our webpage. Uh, please sign up for our announcements. Check our webpage for the upcoming speakers. Thanks again for being with us today. We we'll look forward to having you join us again next week. Bye-bye.